a little bit about the Partnership for Public Service, so I don't have too much to add here. Um, but we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with the goal of making a more effective government for the American people. Um, we do this in a lot of different ways. Um, our federal recruiting and hiring team specifically tries to inspire the next generation of talent to serve, which is why we're particularly excited about getting the opportunity to connect with you all today. Um, we also do, we administer different internships and fellowship programs, um, talk to students directly about the benefits of working for the government, and a whole host of things as well. So our agenda for today, we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, but we're really excited to get through it all. So we're gonna start a little bit about why you should want to work for the federal government. Why choose a career in public service? Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the civil service looks like today, where the jobs are located, how to get into these positions, um, either through internships and fellowships or through using usajobs.gov. Um, we'll talk a little bit about pro tips for navigating that website and then also how to build out your resume, how to navigate the security clearance process, and just generally what happens after you apply. That's a lot for me to get through in my presentation. So we'll have a panel of experts who can provide uh, more real world examples of everything that we talk about today. I'm gonna try and get through this in about 25 minutes. So we have um, the absolute most amount of time for the panel to answer your questions. So what I ask of all of you um, is one, just be patient with me, we're gonna go quickly. Um, but two, if you have any questions throughout my presentation, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, we will come back to them when we get to the panel, but I don't want you all to forget your questions. So even if on the next slide you have a question and we won't get to it to the panel, um, still feel free to just put it into the chat. Great. So our first topic is why you should want to work for the federal government. So the federal government um, has a lot of perks to being to being in it. So first, you can make a big impact. So there are so many jobs across the federal government, but they all have a direct impact on the lives of the American people. Um, you can think of the times we're in right now. So in this COVID-19 environment, federal employees play a huge role in protecting the public um, and keeping them safe throughout this crisis. Um, there's also great benefits to working for the federal government. So they have really flexible telework policies, which is um, something that I think everyone is thinking of right now in particular. Um, but they also have other um, opportunities that will help you balance out um, your work life from your home life. They also have student loan repayment options, um, health and retirement benefit options. And I know this might not be top of mind um, for young students, but it's something important to consider when going into the workforce. We also like to mention training and development opportunities. So if you come into the federal government um, as a young leader and wanting to work your way up, there's a lot of opportunities to um, receive leadership development training, professional development training that will get you on your way to working up in your career. And finally, we like to mention that there are opportunities in all fields. So whether you are a public policy major, public administration major, or in the sciences, economics, math, there's an opportunity for you in the federal government. And we'll come back to that concept a little bit later. So our first um, topic we just discussed was meaningful work and how you can make a big impact in the federal government. So we have two examples of young federal leaders who are making a big, big impact that we like to highlight. Um, so both of these women are nominees for our Service to America medals. Um, and so the first one is Monica Ager Jacobson, who's an attorney advisor at the Department of State, and she is a 2020 Emerging Leader SAMEs finalist. Um, in 2019, Monica played a central role in identifying and making determinations as to whether human rights abuses had been committed and then imposing sanctions. Um, she streamlined this process and laid a framework that is not only for the U.S., but really a model that can be replicated around the world. So that's just one person having a huge impact, not just on the United States, but on the world's foreign policy. Dr. Beth Ripley is another example. She works for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and she developed an interconnected hospital-based 3D printing network designed to share resources and knowledge throughout the Veterans Health Administration. So this network grew from over three to 30 hospitals, has benefited over a thousand veterans, um, reduced surgical uh, times by one hour on average, prevented unnecessary surgeries, and more. Um, so most recently and most relevant to this time, actually, this network of VA hospitals has begun to design and produce um, PPE and ventilators to aid in the national coronavirus response. So another great example of a federal employee doing really meaningful and impactful work every single day. Um, and that's just two examples, but really there are countless. 
for the federal government as at a glance. So this slide is just an overview of the jobs that are available in the executive branch. So the federal government is the largest employer in the country, so there's no shortage of opportunities within it. There's over 370 agencies and subcomponents, um, and which accounts for over 2.1 million federal employees. There are opportunities across different levels of government, and there are opportunities across the country. So one thing that um, is a common misconception among students is that you have to live in the DC area to work for the federal government, um, but actually only 15% of the workforce is located in DC. The majority of opportunities are outside of it. So really you can go anywhere across the country, be in any field, um, and still work for the federal government. So this slide um, is a little bit more about where the jobs are in the federal government. Um, so this can kind of answer those common questions that we get of what should I study? Do I have to go to grad school? Um, what should I major in to work for the federal government? We're here to kind of answer those questions. So as we mentioned in an earlier slide, the federal government is hiring in all fields. Each agency has many different functions, so they need specialists to carry out their missions, but they also need support functions for their operations. So we can use the Department of Veterans Affairs as an example. They need doctors and nurses and hospital staff to carry out their mission of providing health care to veterans on the front lines. But they also need employees who carry out support functions. So like any other business, they would need those in budgeting, in finance, in human capital, technology, management legislative affairs, policy, to pass policy that's preferable to veterans, um, and more. So you can see how even within one agency, um, you have occupations ranging from healthcare to business to policy. So all that being said, this is replicated across every agency. They need those people who will be carrying out the mission, but also support functions as well. So you can kind of see, these are um, interest areas that you all indicated on the pre-survey that we chose to highlight here. Um, and you can see that there are jobs available in every single one of them. Um, I will say these numbers are not perfect comparisons. Um, they're based on what's called a job series code. So it's the way that federal government um, or classifies their jobs on USA Jobs. So they're not perfect comparisons as some of them, for example, the legal field um, covers multiple job series codes. Um, whereas economics is just one or two. But you can kind of see that there's jobs available in every single area. We also like to highlight that there's a lot of jobs available in agencies that may not be the most obvious choice. So we'll use the legal field as a good example. Um, a lot of people think that if they want to be in the legal field, they have to work for the Department of Justice because that's an obvious choice. And while there are many jobs available there, um, there's also jobs available in the legal field at many other agencies. Um, so there's actually the most at the Social Security Administration, and then the VA, then the Treasury, and then the Department of Justice. Um, there's over 23,000 at the Social Security Administration alone. Um, so you can see, even if you um, have an idea of what you want to do, it doesn't necessarily have to be within a specific agency. And this is replicated across all occupations. So international relations, foreign affairs, and similar fields, a lot of people think Department of State right away, which is great because there's many opportunities available at state. Um, but you can also work in um, many other agencies and still work in foreign affairs. For example, the Department of Justice um, has international relations jobs, and the Department of Defense does as well. There's so many more jobs than the ones listed here, so you can look up job series codes for any major in any occupation. Um, you can just go on USA Jobs, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and find um, your fit by major. We also just like to mention that all the skills you're gaining now will be relevant if you wish to work for the federal government. Even if you're not studying any of the majors we specifically listed, there's still many opportunities. Um, political science, for example, doesn't really have a specific job series code, but I know it's a popular major amongst this group and those more generally who want to work in public service. Um, but a degree in political science will give you skills in critical thinking, analysis, communications, writing, and more that's applicable across government and across all these different job series. So now that we've talked about all the opportunities that are available in the federal government, we're going to talk through some different ways to get into the federal government and how to get your start. So the first thing we like to mention is the Pathways Program, which is really an umbrella term for three different programs that came about under the Hiring Reform Initiative of 2010. Um, so these are streamlined developmental programs tailored to remote employment opportunities in the federal workforce. One large benefit of all these pathways programs is that participants are eligible for conversion after successful completion of their program, which means that the agency can convert them into full-time employees. 
This is not always the case with non-pathways interns, so we just like to mention it because if you're looking to stay in government after an internship, these programs will be a really great fit for you. So the first one is the internship program, which is an opportunity for students from high school to graduate level to work in agencies while still in school. So this is kind of your traditional internship experience. These are different than a lot of the student volunteer opportunities that are available at many agencies because they are paid opportunities. The next one is the recent grad program. So you're eligible for this program up to two years after graduation. Um, that can be either from an undergraduate program or a graduate program. So you can qualify um, right after your undergrad or in the future after grad school. Um, this program also is a developmental program. So it includes an orientation and training and development um, throughout your time in the program. And then finally, the Presidential Management Fellows Program. So this is also known as PMF, and this is one of government's most prestigious fellowship programs designed to create future government leaders. So this is a leadership development program at the entry level for advanced degree candidates, so master's or professional degree. The application is only open for two weeks in the fall, um, so it's a really quick turnaround, so you have to know in advance um, that you'll be ready to apply. The application for the class of 2021 will open on September 30th and close on October 14th. So you can see that tight window in the fall. Um, how this program works is OPM publishes and provides agencies uh, with a list of finalists that they choose. And then agencies um, provide PMF with more information about their opportunities for the finalists. So essentially, um, if you're a PMF finalist, a whole host of opportunities at specific agencies are open just to you and not the general public. You'll still have to apply to those opportunities, but they're only open to PMFs. And then finalists who would obtain an appointment as a PMF serve in a two-year um, time frame. These are also eligible con for conversion after you complete the program. So while Pathways are kind of government's uh, most known programs, there's also many others that you can go in through. So we are highlighting two here. So one is the Department of Justice Attorney General's Honors Program. So this is an entry level program um, for federal attorneys, which is a really great opportunity. Um, its eligibility is limited to graduating law students or recent law school graduates. Um, but this is a really great opportunity if this is the field that you wanna go into someday. Uh, the number of components participating varies each year. Um, and each component will specify whether positions are permanent or term appoint appointed. So you could get a permanent position through this program, or you could just get a two or three year um, appointment. There's also the Thomas Pickering Foreign Affairs Graduate Fellowship. So this is a Department of State program administered by Howard University. You do not need to be a Howard University student to um, apply to this program, but it's a really great opportunity. And it's open to those who are seeking admission to a two year full-time master's degree program in a field that's relevant to the foreign service, so public policy, international affairs, public administration, et cetera. Uh, you apply the fall of your undergraduate senior year or the fall before you plan to attend graduate school. During this year program, graduate students will complete two internships with State Department, um, one between the first and second year of their program, and then once after the second year of their program is done. One will be domestic and one will be overseas. And then there will also be professional development um, opportunities throughout. And then upon successful completion of your two years master's degree program and fulfillment of foreign service entry requirements, fellows will have the opportunity to work as foreign service officers either in Washington DC or around the globe. So that's a really great program um, if you are wanting to work in international relations or foreign affairs. And then the final program that we'll mention is the White House Fellowship. So this is founded in 1964 by Lyndon B. Johnson. And it's um, one of America's most prestigious programs for leadership in public service. So the White House Fellows um, Fellowship offers except, exceptional young men and women firsthand experience working at the highest levels of the federal government. So individuals who are selected will spend a year working full-time paid um, fellow to a senior White House, House staff, a cabinet secretary, or other top-ranking government official. Um, fellows will participate in an education program, which consists of roundtables discussions with leaders from the private and public sectors, trips to study U.S. policy, both domestically and internationally, etc. Um, applicants must have completed their undergraduate, undergraduate education by the time they begin the application process, uh, but there are no formal age restrictions. It's designed to help entry-level talent um, get a good start in their government service careers, 
but there's no upper age limit. It is a very selective process. Um, applications will open in the fall for the um, year after. Um, you have to go through a series of interviews, first regionally and then nationally. But if selected to this program, um, it's a great opportunity and very prestigious. We also just wanted to highlight a couple of other ways to find jobs in the executive branch. So we talked through pathways, internships and fellowships. We'll talk about USA jobs directly after this, but here are some other ideas of where you might begin your search. So agency websites um, and social media are great examples. Um, so you can go on, for example, careers.state.gov, or just if you're interested in a particular agency, you can just navigate to their website and see if they have open opportunities. You can explore local and virtual uh, federal hiring events. So a lot of agencies will conduct hiring fairs that you can attend um, and just find out more about open positions that way. Um, there's also government internship programs to universities or third party entities. So for example, the Partnership for Public Service um, runs three internship and fellowship programs to get students into government um, across wide fields. So cybersecurity, international relations and innovation. Um, there's other third party entities as well who do internships and program, internship programs like this. Um, government service programs are also great opportunities. So Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, um, they're really good opportunities if you're really interested in serving um, a community and having more opportunities open in the federal service when you come back. And then finally, we like to mention gogovernment.org, which is a partnership run by the, is a website one run by the partnership um, that just has pretty much all the information we cover um, in our presentation today. I see a lot of great questions coming in, so thank you for these, and we will get to them on the panel. Um, but I see one that I can answer really quickly. For the White House Fellowship, um, selection is not dependent on the party of the president, so it's a nonpartisan basis. It's a really great question. Great. So now in the remaining time, we're going to talk about how to navigate USA jobs. So this website is just kind of your one stop shop to applying for federal opportunities. It's the best place to look for federal positions. Um, this, these are just a few screenshots shots from the USA jobs website. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of information here. Um, the first thing we always recommend is just creating a profile on USA jobs. This will allow you to save searches. Um, like and save positions for future if you're not ready to apply yet. Um, you can save your resumes on here. Um, it's a really great tool if you're interested in applying for the federal government. So we'll go through a couple tips um, on navigating USA jobs. So the first is selecting hiring paths that apply to you. So this is really great for narrowing down your search when you're not sure where to begin. So for example, we'll use the student and recent graduates hiring path. So when you go on USA Jobs, you can click this and it will show you jobs that are open specifically to students and recent graduates. So it'll show you um, those internship programs that we were just talking about. Um, this is really great because if you are an entry level um, coming into government, you don't necessarily wanna see jobs that are at a really high level where you need 10 years of experience to apply. We recommend just kind of tailoring your search this way. If you're a veteran, go ahead and put that so you can see if there's any special opportunities that are open just to veterans. Um, this will save you a lot of time in filtering through different jobs that don't apply to you. Um, and these hiring paths, selecting them on USA Jobs will only help you. Another really good way to narrow your search is by understanding the GS scale. So, um, this is just going to be a really quick overview, but it's really, really helpful. So you can see here um, the different levels of government. So the GS scale determines what level students will be paid, and it determines the level of work that they will do. Um, it goes up to 15. We only have until 11 here because that's what's most relevant to you. Um, the lowest grade most of you will qualify for is the GS4. So once you begin your search by major or hiring path, the GS level will tell you which job is actually right for you. So you can see here, most of you coming out of your undergrad education um, will automatically qualify for positions at the GS5 level. You can also qualify for GS7 if you graduate uh, with a 3.0 or higher GPA. So that's really great. And the next slide will tell you um, why this is even relevant. 
So you can see here that the GS level corresponds to pay. So for example, if you're in Washington DC coming um, straight out of undergrad with below a 3.0, you can expect to make around $39,000. Um, whereas if you are an undergrad coming out um, of college looking for an entry level position, but you have higher than a 3.0 GPA, you can make about $10,000 more. So this is why it's really important to pay attention to those GS levels and know which one, that, which one you qualify for. The previous slide we've showed um, just qualifies you based on education alone, but there's many other ways. So for example, if you graduate with below the 3.0, so you're at a GS5, you can gain work experience to work your way up to a 7, 9, 11. So it's not just education, but that's what many of you will use to qualify um, when you first graduate. So we like to just highlight this because when you're looking at a job, um, this is exactly how you'll know whether or not you can qualify. So now we'll just talk a little bit about the job announcement, which is a really important part um, of looking at a job on USA Jobs. So this will tell you exactly what you need to do to apply for the job. So you can see here, um, it tells you the GS level, it tells you where the job is, um, it tells you the salary and who it's open to, whether it's the general public um, or some specific hiring path. We recommend reading these job announcements very, very closely because they'll tell you a lot of good information. So, for example, it will tell you the basic requirements. It will tell you what degree that you need to qualify for the job, or it will tell you what level of experience that you need, and it will tell you exactly how you'll be evaluated. Um, we recommend, again, just reading these as closely as possible and then tailoring your application to that. So if they say that you need um, four years of work experience for this job, you'll want to make sure that your resume clearly shows four years of work experience and is directly relevant to this job. Um, Again, just read through it before you even think about applying, before you um, work on tailoring your resume for the job. Just make sure it lines up exactly with the job announcement. The job announcement um, will also tell you what documents you need to submit. So for example, it might say that you need transcripts, um, and it will say it needs transcripts and it needs to show your university on top. Just make sure you're meeting all those requirements exactly uh, they're not suggestions and you can be disqualified if you don't uh, meet those requirements. So this is an example that shows you exactly that. Um, it says at the bottom that you may be rated ineligible or not qualified if you don't submit the proper documents. So once you've read through that job announcement, then you'll be ready to tailor your resume to the job announcement. So you can see um, on the left hand side is a federal resume compared to a private resume. They look pretty different. Um, everyone kind of hears in the private sector, your resume should be no more than one page for entry level position. In the federal government, your um, resume can be anywhere from two to five pages, even at the entry level. So it's really important to kind of know the differences between a federal and a private resume. USA Jobs has a great tool called the Resume Builder. So you can go in and it will tell you, it will prompt you um, on exactly how to enter your information. So for those of you who've never had experience building a federal resume before, I definitely recommend the Federal Resume Builder on USA Jobs. Um, again, why we say to read the job announcement first is that you can tailor your resume to the job announcement. Um, a silly example that we always love to give um, is if the job announcement says we need someone with a gray sweater, um, don't write it on your resume, I have a charcoal cardigan, just say you have a gray sweater. Um, just tell them that you meet those exact requirements um, to get the job. So we'll go through this next um, steps really quickly because I really wanted to pass it off to the panel to talk more about what happens after you apply. But after you apply, you can track your application through USA Jobs, which is again why we recommend making a profile. So the agency will notify you when your application is received, if you meet the basic qualifications, when your application has been referred to the selecting official, and then if you're offered the position. And you can track all of that through USA Jobs. Um, you, you can follow up. There's contact information on the job announcement um, if you want to follow up. But just remember that agencies have a high volume of applicants, so be patient while you move along the process. Um, it's okay to follow up with the individual listed on the job announcement, but we generally suggest waiting two to three weeks before doing so. If you choose to follow up, just be specific and direct with your um, request. Um, our panel will go a lot more in depth about what happens after you apply. But one thing that does happen is background checks and security clearances. 
So background checks, um, you'll have to go through no matter what position you're applying for. And then security clearances, you may or may not need a security clearance depending on the position. But we always like to give um, tips for navigating this process because um, one, security clearance process is pretty extensive. Um, and two, it's just um, a reality of working for the federal government that we want you to be prepared for and confident going into. So one thing we like to say is begin gathering relevant information now. So you can go online and actually see what the forms look like in general um, for the security clearance process. So they'll ask you, for example, um, have you left the country in X years? And if you know that's coming by looking at the forms, then right now you can start to track your travel um, before you even apply to a federal job years down the line. Um, we also like to recommend be smart and curb your bad habits now. So um, just don't do anything. You can look at those forms, see what they ask you. Don't do anything that might disqualify you. Um, if you have a misdemeanor or encounter with the law, just make sure that it doesn't happen again. Just kind of curb those things now. Um, we say stay out of debt and diligently repay it. So be careful with debt. Um, this can be an issue for students. We always like to mention that if you have student loan debt, that is not at all a problem. Um, what becomes a problem is when you're not repaying that debt. Um, so it's okay to have student loans, but just make sure you are diligently repaying it. And then the final thing is just be completely honest. So it's more advantageous for you to be honest on the front end um, than to find out that you are dishonest later. Um, you'll definitely be disqualified if you lie on the forms, um, whereas if you have a minor transgression, um, you might be able to talk that through and it might not be a big deal to that agency, um, but just be honest about it up front. So that was a super quick run through of, um, of everything. And I'm actually very happy that we got through it in under 30 minutes. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it off to the panel of experts and Margo will introduce them, um, but they really can answer your questions in better detail and give you more real world examples of everything that we just talked about. So Margo, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Leah. That was terrific. A lot of information in a short period of time, but I think you're seeing some great energy here with all the questions. And thank you to the panelists who are already chiming in to help answer them. Um, so we'll just move right into the panel. I wanna take a moment to introduce everyone. So we have Ella Holman here. You've got people, people's names listed, but she's a human resources strategist with, it's actually the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer. Sometimes we get that confused. Um, with the U.S. House of Representatives. She also spent time um, as an HR specialist at the Office of Personnel Management, so she can share a little bit more about her experience there in HR as well. Um, we have Deborah Eckhorn here with us. She's the Recruitment Program Manager with Human Capital Office at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Philip Beekman, who's a diplomat in residence for New England. He is also a Phi Beta Kappa from, I believe it's Michigan State. I hope I got that right. I don't know if there are any other uh, Phi Beta Kappas on the panel, but you should definitely chime in and let us know if you are. Um, we, and finally, we have Keisha Monroe. She is the Pathways Program Officer and Student Programs Manager um, with long title, Str Strategic Recruitment, Diversity and Inclusion with the Office of Human Capital, um, Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. And she previously spent time at the Department of Health and Human Services as well, um, so can talk to us a little bit perhaps about opportunities uh, at HHS as well as DHS. So um, with that, really excited to have you all join us and thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this. Um, I wanna jump in, I'm gonna ask first Ella if you will go first, but my question for all the panelists for a short answer is just to tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path, um, how you got into government, and then if you had a liberal arts background, how did you translate um, your skills into the federal government? So Ella, can we start with you? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. It's really great to see you. It's such an honor to be here. Um, my name is Ella Holman. As Margo said, I work at the um, Office of the Chief Administrative Officer, which is one of the House offices at the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, today, happy to talk about my uh, career and experiences, but I always like to caveat, I'm talking about my experiences and my views, I'm not here representing my office today. Um, but that said, I work in the Human Resources Office at the CAO as a Human Resource Strategist. 
strategists. Um, the CEO is a pretty unique office where we serve the House of Representatives community by providing both administrative, technical, and operational services so members are able to perform their constitutional duties. Uh, so I work with our 700 employees at our office um, who range in doing work, everything from um, accounting and helping member offices uh, administer their finances all the way through um, trade positions like our logistics and support office who actually um, build and create furniture uh, that is historical and accurate and also move it into member offices. Um, I actually studied sociology um, in my undergraduate degree, so government isn't necessarily where I thought I would end up. It has absolutely been um, the best career path and I'm very happy to where it led me. So um, in my sociology degree, I kind of figured out um, that I didn't necessarily want to go the research route, but I really loved Loved people and wanted to work directly um, with people in some way. Um, so I realized I was very interested in recruiting and hiring and I made that known within the career office and a couple other offices that I was involved with um, at my university. So um, I got connected through uh, that office to the Office of Personnel Management or OPM. They're essentially the HR agency of government, if you haven't heard of them. Um, and I was connected to a individual there who was recruiting for a position that was actually a pathways position. It was right um, in the transition of transitioning a program before Pathways and then Pathways. So I started interning at OPM um, going into my senior year, so the summer in between my junior and senior year. I was in one of those Pathways internships where I was able to intern as long as I was still enrolled as a student completing my degree. Um, and then once I graduated, it was a great fit for me and a great fit for the office. So they were able to convert me right after graduation to a full-time position there at OPM. Um, while at OPM, I did recruiting and staffing for the agency, so um, learned a lot about the recruiting and hiring process from the back end. So happy to share all that as well as talk a little bit about Pathways experiences uh, later on. Awesome, thank you so much, Ella. Um, Deborah, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about your career path and, and your background if it was in liberal arts? Sure, hi, I'm Deborah Eichhorn. I currently work at the US Government Accountability Office, GAO. And for those of you who are not familiar with GAO, we are an independent nonpartisan agency that works for the Congress, so works for Ella's shop, um, often called the Congressional Watchdog. We look at how taxpayer dollars are spent and we provide Congress and federal agencies with objective, reliable information to keep the government safe, to help the government save money and work more efficiently. And I have a little example of building on what Leah mentioned earlier in the presentation about making a big impact. Um, today, you know, on the Washington Post at 10 o'clock was posted a big headline, um, Treasury sent more than 1 million coronavirus stimulus payments to dead people, congressional watchdog fines. So saving 1.4 billion, or spending an extra $1.4 billion. And that was part of GAO's mission um, and responsibility to, after the stimulus um, payments went out for COVID, is to jump right on board to provide some um, accountability to where that money was being spent. So $1.4 billion um, no, um, highlighted by GAO. So I, th I think that counts as making a big impact, uh, big impact, Leah. So I came into government um, through actually the, PM, the PMF program, a predecessor of it, the PMI program, and um, which was a fabulous way to enter government. So I encourage anybody who's going the graduate route to pursue that as one option. Um, and I had an, uh, my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in public policy. So it fit the more traditional route into government, but it was um, public policy rather than um, political science, but either one would, would work for the career path that I ended up taking. Um, so I came to GAO um, through the PMI program, but also through the GAO's application process. And at GAO have served in analyst roles doing the kind of work I described to you, um, looking at how to make environmental programs um, run more efficiently and effectively and make sure they were accomplishing the goals that were set out in, by, by the Congress. Um, but I realized that um, the, doing that kind of research analysis wasn't as interesting to me, maybe building on what Ella said, you know, with her sociology degree, the research piece wasn't what made, you know, kind of got, well, she wasn't as passionate about that part. I'm using those, those words myself. I wasn't as passionate about the analyst, the analysis part, but what I was really passionate about was how could I help GAO become a better organization internally? What could I do to improve our processes, not worry about the processes of other organizations, 
but what could I do to help GAO? So early on in my career, I began looking for opportunities within GAO to kind of stretch those skills and build those skills even as an entry level person. And in doing so, I had a lot of sort of detail opportunities and um, within GAO and worked in a variety of projects, but I also decided to leave GAO um, and um, see where there was other ways I could use those skills and follow that path. So I went and worked um, at the Patent and Trademark Office as um, to do that kind of work. They had a process improvement office. I also went to this, this Census Bureau as they were getting ready for the 2000 Census. And hopefully all of you are well aware of the importance of the Census, um, this being a decennial year. And um, also to the a UN office in Geneva that did similar work. But ultimately I came back to GAO and for the last um, 15 or 20 years have mostly been working in internal communications as well as um, now the last couple of years in the recruiting field. And what I think just want to share with you is that and I think um, Ella gave this example too, there's a lot of opportunities within an agency to move around as you discover what you enjoy doing and what you're good at. And also across government, there's opportunities to move across agencies and find be better fits or different fits. I, I have found that the value that I brought back to GAO, having worked at these other organizations, has been invaluable. I, I can look at things at GAO and say, oh, that's unique to GAO, or I can think, oh, that's the same as I saw at these other three places I work. So I think that gives me a con contextual sophistication that I can bring to my work, especially on things that cut across government. So I think that, that covers it for now. That's terrific. Thank you so much. And Phil, you're getting lots of activity in the chat box here. So thank you for all the time you're putting there. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background experience? How did you become the diplomat in residence for the whole New England region? <laughs> sure. Well, uh, uh, greetings, everybody, uh, and th thanks so much for having me on the panel today. Um, so I started out, I've been uh, in the Foreign Service for approximately 15 years, uh, and my interest in uh, uh, international public service started out when I was uh, a student at Michigan State. Um, I had known that I was interested in public service. Uh, my, a bunch of my family members were uh, public servants, but I had assumed it would be at the local or state level. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of sounds pretty cliche, uh, I imagine, but uh, I went on a study abroad experience and just came back and thought, that was amazing. Uh, how could I do something international? And I, I had never heard of the Foreign Service. I'd never even sort of contemplated working, uh, uh, working at a U.S. Embassy, but uh, quickly learned about, uh, about the U.S. Foreign Service and this sort of strange process to become a Foreign Service officer taking this test. Uh, and I took it while I was at Michigan State. Uh, and I didn't pass through. Uh, I tell everybody I, I uh, got through the written test and then crashed at the in per crashed and burned at the in-person test. Um, and so I went off and did some other stuff after Michigan State. I worked on a political campaign. I worked for a uh, local government affairs and lobbying firm in Michigan, got a graduate degree in public administration. And then I headed to Washington where I worked actually at the Partnership for Public Service as a, a research manager. And, uh, uh, but the whole time I sort of maintained this long-term dream of uh, joining the Foreign Service. And uh, uh, how I joined was actually sort of a perfect metaphor for my experience over the past 15 years. Uh, I got a call on a Thursday, the Thursday before Labor Day, from the State Department saying, we just happen to have a slot opening up in the diplomatic training class starting next Tuesday. Would you like to join? And I remember going into my boss at the partnership, uh, her office, and saying, what do I do? This is crazy. It's a life-changing decision. They want me to start on Tuesday. And she said, well, of course you have to take it. So understanding. What a wonderful boss. And that kind of set me off on this uh, amazing path. I've uh, worked overseas four different tours in three different countries, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Trinidad and Tobago, and then multiple jobs in Washington. Um, in terms of education and background, one of the things I love about the Foreign Service uh, is that the only requirements to take the exam are you have to be an American citizen and you have to be at least 20 and 21 to join. So we don't care what you've studied. Lots of people study inter international relations like me, but uh, I have colleagues who are creative writing majors or history majors, geography, we have engineers, whatever. So uh, it is definitely open and we are uh, stock full of uh, folks who have studied in the liberal arts. 
Um, maybe I'll, I'll end there, but uh, I'd love to talk to you guys more about all the different opportunities we have. Great, thank you so much, Bill. And I should mention, Ella is also a partnership alum here. So we have a great organization that sends off people into the world, into public service after a tour of the partnership. So it's wonderful to have you guys back with us today. So thank you. And now, um, Keisha, I would love to hear a little bit more from you about your experience and your path in public service. Hi, yes. Yeah. So I'm Keisha Monroe. I am the Pathways Program Officer and Student Program Manager for the Department of um, Homeland Security for the entire department. I am pretty much the liaison between OPM and then the components that fall within DHS, such as Secret Service, um, Customs and Border Patrol. So I'm like the liaison between OPM and the agencies. Um, I am responsible for creating new pathways so that we can create new opportunities for students and recent graduates as they, you know, find out what careers they're interested in um, in the federal government. Um, I have a passion in it. I myself started as a student about 21 years ago. Um, I was in high school here in DC and our house, high school provided summer internships every year. And each year they provided an internship at a different government agency. So when I first started, when I was about 15, I worked at um, ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearm Agency. And then where I started, where I worked during college, I was at the Internal Revenue Service. Um, so I worked in Internal Revenue Service in the Human Resources Office. I had no interest in human resources, didn't really understand what it meant. However, I liked the work and I, I liked the people, so it kind of stuck. So I've been in human resources ever since. Um, I left IRS once I completed my degree and went to the Department of Treasury, which then was the Financial Management Service, where I served as an HR assistant and then moved to the HR specialist who managed the then Step and Skep student programs and the Federal Career Internship uh, program as well. And it, my passion just grew even more than get, being able to work with people who were just starting their career or restarting a career in a different career field. Um, just being that person, that go-to person to assist them with everything that they needed to know about federal government, how to get into the federal government. Once you're in the federal government, what, how do we move from here? Um, and being able to mentor others, because I myself started as a student or and a recent graduate is once I completed my degree. Um, I went on to DHS where I also managed the Pathways Program and I left there to go to the Health and Human Race, uh, Health and Human Services Department where I also managed the Pathways Program there. Um, I left DHS because I wanted more of a program management experience and less of the whole staffing and recruiting because I also have a background in HR staffing as well. So I'm the person who used to post the jobs on USA Jobs, review the resumes, um, issue the certificates of eligibles to the hiring managers, work with the selectees from those positions as well. And I came back to DHS just this March in the middle of the pandemic, um, where I am now more of just a program management person. I am have no in involvement in the staffing part of it, so I'm not in the hiring anymore. I'm more of the program management, creating um, frameworks for student and recent graduates and how we plan to uh, recruit people in the future because we know as times change, things change, so we have to come up with more innovative ideas to hire new people. Thank you so much. And I will just encourage everybody that is participating, um, feel free to write any questions into the chat or if you'd like to speak, if you could just type a note that says, call on me and I'll um, turn it over so that you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, as we wait for those questions to come in, Keisha, let me just turn back to you again. Could you just tell us a little bit more um, about the, we hear about the Pathways programs and Leah did a nice job explaining them in general. Could you just talk a little bit more about them from your experience at DHS as well as HHS and what can um, students do to like make their application stand out if they want to apply for an internship or recent graduate position? Sure, so with the Pathways program, as Leah explained, there are three parts, there's the internship, there is the recent graduate and then there's the presidential management fellows. With the internship, there's also, there's actually two parts. There's a not to exceed portion of the internship, which means at some point that internship will expire. Um, normally, if you're reading a vacancy announcement for student internships within Pathways, if they're the position expires or it has an expiration, it will definitely be listed in the vacancy announcement. So you want to be sure you read that information. Um, and then there's the other side of it, what we call the indefinite um, portion, which means you work throughout school and once you've completed your degree, you may be eligible for conversion. 
Um, again, with all three programs, conversion is not guaranteed. However, it's the best part of the program. Um, once you complete your degree, you no longer have to search for a job because you graduated and you are slid right into the position that you've been groomed for. Um, Pathways is a great program for someone to get into, receive mentors, you receive training. Um, some agencies have other things like, um, what are they, rotational assignments where you can rotate throughout the department to other office to gain interest and see what career fits you best. Um, the best way to market yourself is to, when you have a resume, people think one pager for the federal government, um, you can go for more than one page if you have the experience to put on more than one page. If you are participating in projects with schools, make sure you list those projects as well because a lot of people may just have education and not experience. However, a lot of the projects that you're working on while you're in school can qualify for some type of experience. Um, if you see volunteer experience um, opportunities, take those. All experience doesn't have to be paid experience. Um, what I found out a lot when I first started at DHS that a lot of people actually volunteer for jobs just so they can get a feel of the career field that they're looking, their interest. And that way, once you graduate from college, you'll have experience that someone who just has a degree does not have. So you wanna highlight all of your volunteer experience that would, um, that's related to the position that's being announced or that you're applying for. Um, the most important thing about applying for a federal government job is to read the vacancy announcement fully. As Leah pointed out some very important areas in the vacancy announcement, you wanna make sure you read the announcement in its entirety. And there's also, um, and pretty much every agency puts in the vacancy announcement a link to the questionnaire that you have to respond to. So before you hit the apply button, if you can look at the questions first to see if this is something that you can actually qualify for and what's needed for that job before you apply for a job. And then, you know, when you go to apply and you get a letter that says that you weren't qualified, you will already know, okay, well, this one may not be something that I would qualify for. Um, always be honest when answering the questions um, and just make sure that your resume shows what your abilities are when it comes to doing that particular job. That's great. Thank you. So, um, so I'm going to turn to you. So the, some of the questions that we're getting are about like, what are, um, what, what are you looking for in a successful applicant and like, what can help increase somebody's success in getting um, these opportunities. We'd love to, to see if you could um, speak to that. And also for like the Pickering and the Wrangle fellowships, when should students be applying for these? Um, and same with Pathways programs, like if they're getting ready to graduate, say next summer or next, next summer, when should they be applying for all of these programs? Sure. So in terms of uh, what we're looking for at the State Department, this is one of my favorite parts about uh, being a State Department recruiter and government recruiting, like it's a big bureaucracy. So uh, there, we have nothing to hide. If you go on our website and I'll post the link, we literally have this list that is, it's, you guys are gonna laugh, it sounds so bureaucratic, the 13 dimensions of a foreign service officer. It's the skill set that we are looking for. Our entire selection process revolves around finding candidates who have these 13 dimensions, 13 skills. So I'll post a link to it, or you can find it on our careers.state.gov website. But that is the actual list that our entire process uh, 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 it revolves around. And I think uh, one of the great parts about the State Department, um, I mean, our mission is to represent America overseas. And we, uh, to do that well and effectively, we need to be representative of America. So we take an incredibly diverse group of folks in. I talked a little bit earlier about how like, technically you don't even have to have a college degree to get into the Foreign Service. And many of us do have graduate degrees. So, you know, every class there are a few folks uh, who don't have college degrees, but it's literally soup to nuts. I mean, there are many, many different paths into the State Department. Um, typically, when I uh, talk to students who are interested in Foreign Service careers, I tell them a little bit about sort of my path and then my wife's path. My wife is also a foreign service officer. She is a heritage Arabic speaker, um, spent a lot of her childhood going back and forth between the Middle East and Detroit where she grew up, uh, had uh, undergrad and graduate degrees from Harvard and Middle Eastern history, um, won the uh, Fulbright and studied Arabic in Amman, was a presidential management fellow at the State Department. She's like a dream foreign service candidate, right? Like there are no other rings she could have grabbed on to, to be perfect to get into the foreign service. So I am not. I joined without a foreign language. Uh, the entirety of my international experience was my month-long study abroad that I did my junior year at Michigan State. 
Um, so uh, we take a lot of different people, diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences. The key for us is your skill set and uh, being able to present in an articulate way uh, how you possess those skills that we're looking for. For uh, Pickering and Wrangle, I mentioned a little bit in uh, the chat. I think another key on that is this idea of adaptability and resilience. To be successful in the Foreign Service, you know, we change everything in our lives every two to three years. We're moving, uh, your job changes, the language you're speaking changes, the food you eat changes, everything changes. You have to be really, really adaptable, um, really resilient. So for that program, very specifically, we're looking for uh, those kinds of things as well. That's great. And remind us when you apply for those programs. Sure. So Pickering and Wrangell are, uh, uh, those are programs that start with uh, us uh, helping you uh, get in and then uh, paying for your graduate degree. So uh, typically, if you're an undergrad student, the applications open right around now, and then you would submit uh, as early as September of your senior year, and then you would matriculate into your grad program exactly one year later in the fall. So you can apply for that as early as your senior year, or if you go off and work in the private sector or do Peace Corps or Fulbright or whatever, and you wanna apply in a couple of years, you can apply uh, uh, at any time for that program. You just have to be interested in going uh, and getting a graduate degree and then joining the Foreign Service. And how about for the Pathways programs? For both, this is a question for both you and Keisha. When should students be applying for Pathways uh, internships and recent grad positions? Keisha, you wanna take that? Sure, so if someone is graduating in May of 2021, um, they can start applying nine months before graduation and uh, agencies who are allowing applicants to apply nine months before graduation, they would have that listed in the vacancy announcement. On um, the majority of the time, agencies want you to have your degree conferred at the time of the application. However, there are many that will allow you to apply nine months before for graduation um, and it's for the recent graduate program if you're looking for a summer job you can start looking for those in October um, between October and March of the coming year for that summer great very helpful so does that sound about on par for State Department pathways yeah I would say uh, the only uh, thing uh, about pathways at state is I'm always pretty frank with uh, people uh, sometimes this can really feel like finding that needle in a haystack uh, or, uh, you know, catching the unicorn. I mean, uh, the vast majority of people who intern at the State Department do so through the unpaid student internship program. So the number of pathways opportunities we have, the paid internships, they're quite small and the vast majority are in Washington. Mm -hmm. That might just be because we're a smaller agency. You guys, DHS or other agencies, much, much, much bigger. So probably a lot more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also, we, we do have a lot of paid opportunities within DHS, within all of the components. However, there are many unpaid as well because a lot, again, they're they're geared towards current college students who want to gain any experience in working in the unpaid projects. Mm -hmm. And Leah, maybe you can put this in the chat function for us. But there's also the Virtual Student Federal Service Program, which State Department runs. But they are they're unpaid internships, but they're virtual and while state is running it it's or overseeing it there are agencies all across the federal government right now that are participating and so you can do it during the academic year and they're also piloting doing some during the summer now so it's just a great way if you want to be able to get some internship experience um, and learn about an agency while you're while you're in an agent while you work while you're in school right now um deborah i want to give you a minute and we only have about five minutes left i want to give you a minute to just explain gao has like historically a very well known both internship and entry level development program. And I just wanted, and a lot of great career progression there. And I just wanted to let you have a chance to talk about that too. Sure. Yeah, the, um, GAO has um, two programs, a, an intern, a paid intern program that it offers in the summer, fall and spring, and also a professional development program that um, is for your, a uh, very formalized program for your first two years at GAO. It sort of mimics a little bit the um, presidential, the PMF program, but just focused on GAO. So let me just first talk about the intern program because that's now the most popular and the, the easiest path to actually get into the entry level program. As um, was mentioned earlier, like the Pathways program, if you finish your internship successfully, you can convert into a permanent position if there's a permanent position available. So our intern program is um, 
paid, it's advertised on USA Jobs. You can also get through to those positions through our website, gao.gov, but all, all GAO um, positions are advertised on USA Jobs. And um, the spring and the fall, you can be part-time, you know, while you're going to school and the summer is full-time. This summer, we did go virtual for the first time. So all of our interns, we kept all of our internship offers um, went um, virtual. The, the fall, I think, will end up being the same. And who knows, maybe the spring will have that option also. The fall internship announcements are closed. Sorry, they finished um, a couple of weeks ago. But if you're interested in finding out more about those internships, you know, sign up for alerts from USA Jobs. You know, as Leah showed you, there's various things you can do to narrow down when you search for positions in USA Jobs. And one of them is once you've narrowed it down to get automatic emails when those positions that meet that criteria um, arrive. And um, like the state that, um, what we're looking for the foreign service we don't service officers we don't you don't have to fit a certain mold either to come to gao we really are looking for some really solid liberal art skills you know really good critical and analytical thinking strong written you know and oral communication skills um teamwork you know all of gao work is done as a as a team there's no um you know products that come out with your name on it it's an institutional product and to be able to work in a team and feel comfortable with that is key and another big um, asset is just to be curious and um, love to learn because at GAO, you're gonna be moving from assignment to assignment every nine months to a year. So to come up to speed on a new topic and enjoy coming up to speed on a new topic is really key. The, the um, development program, which is two years, I'll just give you a couple components and leave a few minutes if there's anything else left to talk about. It provides you um, every six months you get a review um, and pay increase, um, pretty substantial pay increase to help um, in your development and your acclimation to GAO. You're assigned an advisor who will look out for your career development and also provide you feedback. There's extensive training. We put a lot of emphasis at GAO throughout your career on training and certainly in those first couple of years you have a lot you know a lot of training and there's also a lot that's done for this um, for you to meet and interact with your cohort of other PD peers or professional development um, participants so I'll leave it at that but I'm happy to answer any other questions folks might have that's great and then Ella I wanted to give you an opportunity from your since you've been now in a couple of agencies as well as OPM any other advice on how to make your application stand out what are the kind of things that you look for as a as a HR hiring manager can you just talk about that a little bit Absolutely. Really think about what you're doing, whether it be um, in the classroom, you know, student organizations that you're a part of, you, you leadership roles in, all of your experience holistically, and how you're communicating that on your federal resume. Um, as Leah highlighted earlier, uh, the federal hiring process and specifically federal resumes are very different than the traditional private sector uh, process that we think of. So I really encourage you to educate yourselves on that process so that you can best um, promote yourself and your experience within it. Something that I love about the federal hiring process, um, as we were talking about in the chat a little bit, is that, and uh, Keisha mentioned as well, is that volunteer experience um, qualifies you. It does not have to be paid experience. And also think about uh, the, you know, work and roles that you're, you're doing and how you're strategically communicating that. So I always like to give the example, you know, my first job ever was lifeguarding. Um, you can still make that applicable where I was still, um, you know, following policies and procedures. I was still directing groups of 100 or more people. Um, really thinking about how you're strategically communicating both your hard skills or as well as your soft skills. You know, I had to communicate effectively and provide great customer service. You know, these sound much more exciting um, than my job 16 year old working at a pool and teaching swim lessons. Um, but just thinking about how you're strategically communicating those will make you stand out as an applicant and someone reading your resume, especially an HR specialist, um, with the example of you can't assume what someone is saying, we'll really be able to see, okay, here specifically, this individual applicant is mentioning um, not only that they have great communication, but this is different experiences they have where they clearly demonstrate that skill of communication in different instances, and that hiring manager can already envision you in the role because you've clearly outlined what you're capable of. Yeah. Well, thank you all. We're coming to a close. We could have this panel probably for another half hour. You're all terrific, and we just appreciate the time that you've taken to be here today for putting so many resources in the chat feature here and for being willing to be contacted afterwards. We'll make sure all your contact information is shared with our friends at Phi Beta Kappa and then they will send that out to all the students. Um, I just want to thank again, you know, Leah for your presentation and I also want to thank like Anne, Nora, and Eva and everyone else at um, Phi Beta Kappa for putting this together and just congratulations to all of you as being selected.
as, as scholars and we're um, excited and we're here as a resource for you in the future. Um, so, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions in the future. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Margot, Leah, and everyone on the panel. It was wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. And in about 15 minutes, our next session will be starting. So thank you all again.